We're going to read a bit from uh, the book of John over in the last chapter, chapter 21, if you want to turn. And uh, I'm going to read a setting for us to talk about in our lesson about gone fishing. I don't know if you've ever showed up at a business or someone's house and found that there is a sign on the door, closed, gone fishing. I saw the explanation that a really good, avid fisherman seems to think is necessary. Just to explain, I had time, and it was time, I just had to go and do some fishing. That's the way fishermen are. They put it first. If you look at fishing as an avocation, that's the way it is. I don't think the professional fishermen are quite so much that way as the person who has it as a habit. And, uh, excuse me, I tend to say hobby, but uh, it's more habit because they just can't live without it. They, somehow they, they just like the feel of worms on their fingers or something. I, I'm not sure, but uh, they just have to go fishing. I want to pay tribute this evening to somebody you don't know. Is, uh, they called him Pud. I guess that's short for pudding, don't know. But... Uh, Pud Harrison died yesterday morning early in Florence, Alabama. He was a member of the Wood Avenue Church that uh, meets right across the street from our house. And uh, he had been members of other congregations, but he'd been there for a long time. And he was known there as the gum man because he self-appointed himself to give gum to all the children and they knew where to find him every time they went and so he'd give them gum as whether mother wanted it before or after or the janitor preferred it after I guess were factors but Pud would have well he was 94 and he and his sweet wife who's surviving him would have uh, been celebrating 72 years of marriage in August, had his life not been, uh, as it were, cut short at 94. He was fishing not very long ago, and he loved to fish. He fished with uh, the, uh, the system that he liked best was a trot line, I think. Now, we often identify fishing in different ways. You see, I, I brought my pole tonight, and I want to refer to it a little bit later, and I've got my tackle box just in case an opportunity might arrive here before we finish, because you've always got to be ready when it's time. Pud's greatest accomplishment in his own estimation was that when he was 67 years old, he caught a 67-pound catfish on a trot line in the Tennessee River, and that he celebrated. I never spent time with him but with his son, Steve, who drank coffee with me regularly. And I just thought that, uh, you know, it's important that we be aware that when we talk about gone fishing, there's some people who've really had a vested interest in that. I may have told you before, I gained a lasting impression on an October morning, probably 1973, whenever I went to Lake Okeechobee early in the morning, leaving the Miami area about four in the morning and arriving at the lake at six o'clock or so. We went to the bait shop, obviously, to get some bait and things, and there I saw a sign that I've never forgotten and have quoted many times. I love it. It read, Old fishermen never die. They just smell that way. I couldn't forget it. And then I was confident that within weeks after I saw it there, probably it was in some good woman's kitchen <laughs> and may still be there today. Jesus was the great fisherman. Jesus knew how to deal with fish. Peter, I think, is referred to as the big fisherman, and he had a vested interest in fishing also. And in the text that we're going to read this evening, there's an interesting, almost parallel, 
to Luke chapter 5 whenever the great catch occurred as uh, early in Jesus' ministry it occurred. The reason that I'm confident that these are separate incidents, though they have some similarities, is the fact that this is after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And Luke in chapter 5 was not yet down to that part of Jesus' earthly existence. And so I feel pretty safe to say there were similarities. These are not the same incidents. But let me see if I can read well, uh, see well enough to read through verse uh, 14 with you. After this, you always know that means something came before. What had been going on? I turn a page and back and I see Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. I look a little further back and it speaks of the resurrection. And then he makes that appearance to one woman. Obviously, if you read all the Gospels, he appeared to several women. And then he appeared to the disciples, some of them on the road to Emmaus that afternoon, but apparently later in the evening in Jerusalem, he appeared to the group, but Thomas wasn't there. Next, it's Jesus and Thomas. Again, this time, Jesus has con Thomas has been absent the first visit, but he can't believe. And he said, I'll have to stick my hand into his side. I've got to see the nail prints in his hands. And then Jesus, of course, whenever he's there again, said to, to Thomas, would you like to insert your hand here? You want to put your fingers into my nail? No, 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 no. <laughs> he wasn't that bold. These are things that have been happening before. When Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about the appearance in 15, he talks about the appearances of Jesus. He lists these as appearing with the disciples at various times. And one time when 500 people were there, some of whom, most of whom I believe is the wording, is it says most of whom are still alive. The resurrection of Jesus was well attested and uh, all these records make that clear. No wonder in the immediate words before the, after this, is the fact that John said, now Jesus did many other signs and wonders in the presence of his disciple that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe and the believing you may have life through his name. With that having been, as it were, insult, uh, inserted into the, context of the account he says and after this Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee or Tiberius this translation says and he revealed himself in this way Simon Peter and Thomas called the twin and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, uh, we'll, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. As other nights we know they had experienced. But just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, and yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And so they cast their net, and now they were not able to, to haul in, haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. And that disciple whom Jesus loved would be John, speaking of himself that way. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that, it was heard that it was the Lord, he put on his, his outer garments, for he had stripped to work, and, and he threw himself into the sea, and the other disciples came to the boat 
uh, with the boat, dragging the net with the fish, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out of the on the land, they saw a coal charcoal fire in place with some fish that were laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. And so Simon Peter went to board and hauled in the net ashore, uh, full of large fish, 150 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew that it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. In this scenario, there are two main characters. Jesus, of course, is at the forefront of the whole situation. And then there's Simon Peter. When we reflect upon the experience that Jesus had had with this small group of men, you remember that he found them fishing. Isn't that interesting? He found them. When he first found them, they were fishing. Matthew chapter 4 talks about the fact that they were fishing by the Sea of Galilee, probably that time further north, and uh, he saw them and he called them to be fishers of men. Come, follow me. You've been catching fish, but now I'm going to make you fishers of men. From now on, you will be catching men. And he died on the cross later, just so that they'd be able to do that fishing, do that catching, do that saving, bringing those people to the opportunity of eternal life that was made possible through his death, burial, and his resurrection. These are things that somehow come together. When you're dealing with God and his providence, you usually are not so conscious of this connects with that, and this follows, and therefore it's going here. But rather, when we get to here and we look back, we can say, I see, I see, I see how this connects with that. These things all are coming to a head now, so far as Jesus' life upon the earth is concerned. Even now, he's already been killed, but he's resurrected, and he's in their presence again. That's Jesus. But then there's Simon. He was apparently quite distraught at Jesus having died on the cross. I think all the apostles were that way. They had such hopes. They spent those three, three and a half years with Jesus and he had talked to them about the kingdom of heaven and what it was all going to be like, the role that they were going to have in it. And they had high aims and ambitions. They didn't understand the spiritual aspects of it nearly as well as needed to be. But when he died on that cross and they buried him and they saw he's dead, they seemingly forgot all the prophecies that he'd given I'll be back on the third day. I'll raise from the dead on the third day. They hadn't seen that happening. That wasn't common. They hadn't grasped. They hadn't pulled it all together. Their faith wasn't mature. And so when it looks like what we've been pursuing will turn out just to be a short time and done, in his despair and depression, I guess, he said, I, I just got to go fishing. I'm going fishing. I don't know how many fishermen I have known who whenever they were depressed, when things weren't going right, they lost a job, there was a serious illness in their family. Whatever was happening that was out of the ordinary and distressing them, they feel like, if I can just go to my safe zone, if I can just go to where I'm happy, if I can just go to where I can forget 
otherwise. I, I, I've been accustomed to not having these things on my mind when I'm fishing, and I just want to go fish. Other people have other things that they do, but fishermen fish. So Simon Peter, in that hour of desperation, said, I'm going fishing. The others were of the same ilk. They've been professional fishermen too. At least some of those that are listed there, the sons of Zebedee and his brother Andrew, had certainly been called with him initially by the Sea of Galilee. They're fishermen too, and they said, we're coming along. Let's, let's all go fishing. And so that's why we choose the topic tonight, Gone Fishing. What are the takeaways for us from this scenario, this case that is spelled out so in the Gospel of John? Well, because we're having vacation Bible school and at sea, going a sail with Jesus, and we're having lessons, maybe including at least the great catch, if not this particular incident, I thought maybe we might see if we could find some applications that would be worthy of our consideration this evening. As I said earlier, fishing can be a profession, an avocation, but now what we reveal and what Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew chapter 4 especially reveals a third aspect, a third possibility. It could be more than fishing for fish as an avocation or even as a profession. It can, in fact, be a way of life religiously, spiritually, catching the souls of men, being a fisherman in the sense of going into all the world and spreading the gospel everywhere and casting the great net to try to see who might come in, who might be gathered into the kingdom. That can be what we live for. That can be what we want to do in our moments of distress. When our, in our moments of relaxation and our free time, we may want to say, I'm going to go fishing. I just want to find somebody lost and try to help them be saved. There is no greater joy, certainly not in the mind and the experience of a true soul winner, than to have that become the case. I found one, I found one, I found somebody who listened, I found somebody who's searching, I found somebody that I can teach. Sometimes we find the door locked and the proprietor says on his note gone fishing maybe just maybe we need to get some notes like that ourselves and we need to be ready to place them on the door of our house and our business and sometime we need to dedicate to the business of fishing I don't have time to be here today, folks, with my store open because I'm out trying to win souls. At some point, you're going to need a guide. Guides are great. Everybody, even, even these, these avid fishermen use guides. There are people that make their living telling other people where to fish. I'm amazed at that. A while back, uh, my son-in-law, Mike, was telling me that on a given day, he was going to do a favor for me, but eh, that got postponed because he said my uncle, who is a fishing guide up on Lake Texoma, has got a customer who's coming Friday, and so Thursday, he wants to go out and look for where the fish are, and he's invited me to come along, and what you want done will just have to wait. I'm going fishing. I had no problem with that, but it became an excellent illustration of what I'm talking about here. The fact that you need a guide, you need some direction, and you need some help. None of us ever become absolute perfection in the terms of soul winning, because different kinds of fish bite different kinds of bait. Different kinds of fish are found in different kinds of water, different depths of water in the shade and in the sunlight and down by the bank deep 
and not so much, and some surface bite, and some will only bite off the bottom. And the guide would know all that. And so I suggest that we need to study more and more the way that Jesus did it. Now, I'm not proposing that tonight we get into a lot of discussion as to how Jesus won souls. But I will propose that if you'll just read the Gospels and see how Jesus dealt with individuals and then use that as your guide, your outline of how to reach souls, you can't beat that. You can't go to a seminar somewhere where some man who's had some success in winning souls will tell you this is how I do it. You can't go anywhere that's going to give you something better than just studying the example of Jesus and dealing with different people. Oh, it could be with blind Bartimaeus. It could be with a woman at the well. It could be with Zacchaeus. Any other people he dealt with. Just look at the principles that are involved. He is that great fisherman who would have us to understand that when it comes to this business, we need to be fruitful. We need to catch fish. In fact, the parable that he used over in John 15 about the good shepherd and about the, the great, he said that every vine that isn't bearing fruit, gets that limb gets cut off, it, it gets pruned, and, and it gets thrown out and and eventually gathered up at the end of the rose and it gets burned, it's unprofitable. But he said, you can bear fruit in me. We must stay close to Jesus. and Use his principles and his tactics. And whenever we do, we can reach the people, we can bear the fruit, and we can remember this is what it's all about. He knows where they're biting. He knows how to approach. I cited this morning from Luke 19.10 that he said, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. His main business was touching souls and bringing them into a relationship with him and with God that would ensure that they'd have the opportunity of eternal salvation. One of the clearest examples of, of that being the case is in John chapter 4. That's the place that you find the discussion that he had with the woman at the well. But I want to go beyond the discussion with her. When that was done and the disciples had come back from the city with food, they urged him, Lord, eat. And he was so enthused. The scripture doesn't say he was so enthused. Don't, uh, I'm not quoting a passage at that point. I, I am anticipating that that was the case. He was so excited about having had this conversation and all the opportunity there was to influence this woman who would, before the day was over, go back to her city and when would influence a lot of other people and then gangs of people would come out to see him. He must have been smiling, thinking, I know what's going to come of this. These are great things, great moments. I've just had a great morning. And he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't understand, you don't know about. To do the will of my Father, that is my food. I just get off on that. And I, 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 I can set aside my natural uh, needs and, and hunger whenever I can engage myself in helping someone spiritually. That's real fishing for souls, isn't it? That's the way he was. Nobody could help us better than just studying those examples. That's, that's why when Steve Ridgell came a couple of years ago and he, he had that program called Can I Tell You a Story? He wanted to tell stories about Jesus and his relationship with people. And we can learn and we can do that as fishers of men. We need to understand, though, that this business of fishing, particularly fishing for souls, can be some really hard work. Like we said this morning about being on, at setting sail with Jesus and being on the ship of salvation, that it's not a luxury liner. There's work involved. 
We all should heave ho and do our part at the oars and whatever else is needed. And part of it is spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to work because, you see, when it gets down to the bottom line, the saving of souls requires work. We, we, we will not grow a church. We will not save a lot of souls. We will not have a lot of baptisms just because we decide that we've got the newest and the fanciest pretty thing. We've got a lure. Uh, it's, it's a top floater, and they hit it every time and just throw it out there, and, and every time we throw it out, we're going to get one. No, 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 that isn't how you win souls. It's with the word of God, the message of salvation, and it's with constancy, with the, I call it soul consciousness, having on our mind all the time that we're fishing and for what we are fishing. We're fishing for souls that will live forever in heaven. That's our business. That's our calling. That's why we're gone fishing all the time. And every, what we call sometimes ministry, sometimes we call them programs, but every initiative that we have in the church ought to, I believe, ought to dovetail into one thing, that they all would point in one direction and down at the core of what they all are about is the simple objective of saving souls. We're gone fishing when we're teaching a Bible class on Sunday morning. We're gone fishing whenever we are teaching someone at home when mamas are raising their children to serve the Lord, whenever daddies are encouraging their sons to preach the gospel, when we're helping our neighbors and when we're reaching out to people in need, we're gone fishing because the objective is not just to put something on somebody's table today or tomorrow, but to save his soul. And that was the objective of every incident we have recorded in the ministry of Jesus when he was dealing with other people. When he healed people, it wasn't just to make them well. It was when he fed 5,000 or 4,000. It wasn't just to give them a meal. He wanted them to follow him. He was fishing. Fishing for followers who would learn and obey. Ah, uh, these guys. I remember one. His name happened to be Willie. Willie. And he lived in northeast Texas, uh, close to Lake of the Pines. I had a friend named Wayne Condry. I guess one of the closest friends that I have ever had. Wayne and his wife, Frida, had a camp out on Lake of the Pines. And their cabin there, as I recall, was an old railroad car that they had converted or two they'd put together. And invited us one Easter weekend to go to Lake of the Pines with them and do some fishing. And Willie lived near him and, and was a guide on that lake. So I remember we stopped in the road when we met Willie and his pickup truck and Wayne said to him, what, what, we haven't done any good yet. What, what are they biting this week? And I learned that Wayne at Willie was not just a guide, but he was a pretty good philosopher too. <laughs> we weren't paying him to guide us, mind you. And so he said to Wayne, well, just keep your bait in the water. He's got to eat sometime. And that's all he told us. But I've thought more and more, when it comes to soul winning, isn't that still the case there too? Keep the paint in the water. Because one time or another, everybody is going to have some calamities, some uh, 
disheveled kind of experiences that happen in his life. Things are going to be awash and he's going to feel insecure and, and I, I, I need something to hold on to. Keep the bait in the water. He's going to need it sometime. Stay close by and be ready always to be a fisher of men. That's what you want to do. You see, Jesus didn't ever imply that you ought to go fishing for one or two or three. I don't think the rod and reel would have been his tool at all. You remember he said, use the net. Throw the net out. The net's designed to catch a lot. And in the cases we've mentioned tonight, they caught so many they couldn't handle them all. But Jesus didn't need any fish. The big fisherman, you see, he already had some. That's one of the most interesting parts of that whole account to me is that he told them where to catch 153 fish. And then later he told them to bring some of those. But when they got to the campsite, he'd already started a fire and he already had fish. He didn't need their 153. He already had fish there. In fact, he could take two fish and make enough to five, feed 5,000. But he was letting these guys do their own fishing because they needed to learn these principles that we need to learn also. I think there's a suggestion here that you be ready always that that applies to the business. Always be prepared. I decided to, to say it this way. Just always have your pole close by. I dare not try to tell you how many miles this rod and reel have ridden in the trunk of that Lincoln car of mine since I've lived in Wichita. I could count on one hand the times it's been out, but I just keep it there. And this bait box stays right by its side. It's in the trunk. I was a little confused this afternoon. I thought it was there, and it was in the back of Betty's car. I guess I drove it last time to Alabama. But as you, I know she can tell you, and maybe I might have said it in the presence of Josh as we made our recent trip, but I'm always driving along and I almost lose my breath when I get to a, what looks like a deep blue pond and I'll say, oh, that needs so much to be fished. There's nobody there using it, but I don't ever seem to have time. You see, I like to fish too. I've done a whole lot more fishing than I have catching when it comes to the literal fish. But would you bear with me just a few minutes to let me tell you some fish stories that are mine in terms of soul winning. They're not to be considered braggadocious, but experience. And I would hope that as I tell you about how these evolved, that you might see opportunities that you otherwise would have overlooked in your own life. There was a man who was walking home. I was driving between Athens, Texas and Siegelville, Texas, a route that I took twice a week down to teach at Trinity Valley College and back to my office. And on my way home one particular Tuesday or Thursday, somewhere near Maybank, I found a man walking beside the road. He was not trying to hitchhike, he just walking along the road. But I thought, I've got a full station wagon of space here, and let's, let's see if this guy needs a ride. And I admit, that was about 1970, a little different world. And I stopped him. He came up to the car and I said, uh, would you like a ride? He said, yes, I would. 
I said, get in. I'm going to, where are you headed? He said, to Dallas. And I said, I'm going to Seagoville. That'll get you almost there. We rode along a little while, and I said, uh, where, where have you been? How is it you're out here walking like this? And he said, well, I've been in prison for three years, and I'm on my way home. I've just been released. It was at that point I said, if you've been in jail, why don't you have that long screwdriver in your pocket? And uh, he said he picked up on the road. <laughs> he was not a threat. We talked more, and I said, well, a man who's coming from the experience that you just had must be looking for a better way of life. He said, yes, sir, I sure am. And I said, I believe I can help you find that. We talked about the gospel and Jesus and salvation all the way to Siegelville and to my office, and there we studied a while with the Bible open. And I took him into the auditorium and there baptized him. Then I took him to his home in Oak Cliff to his wife, who happened to be a member of a church of Christ in the city that I knew. He was just there. I could have driven by. I've driven by a lot of other people, but I stopped that day. I was on the way another time from Dallas Airport, Love Field, I believe it was at that time. It dates the time. I was on my way to Huntsville, Alabama to hold a gospel meeting. I had a connection in Nashville that Saturday night and I was running late. In the waiting area in Dallas, I noticed a guy that had a, a suit bag over his shoulder, and it was a store with which I was familiar. And I thought he must be local, but I didn't take it any further. And then in Nashville, as uh, we were waiting again, I approached him and we visited a bit and knew a few things and people in common. We sat down and he started to tell me his story, and he needed help. We sat together on the next leg of the flight, and when we got to Huntsville, he took a room in the same motel that I was to be in, rode with the same taxi there. We studied till two in the morning, and the next day, he came to the meeting, and he walked the aisle at the invitation song and was baptized. He was the first of 15 to be baptized there that week. And his coming and his story were both part of influencing other people to take advantage of the opportunity that was presented. And I'm glad that I said, hello, I am familiar with the store that that bag advertises. Are you from Dallas or the area? And another soul had a chance to go to heaven. I was eating dinner one Saturday night at Catfish Cabin near the, Bowl, not Bowles, but Buckner Orphan's home in Dallas, East Dallas. There's something about the waitress that seemed open and I got a conversation going and learned that she lived in an apartment building close to the church building where I preached. Invited her, sought to study with her. Beginning that next week, we started to study, and about three weeks later, she became Christian. There was a walk to raise money for the Hialeah Christian School down in Florida. It was during the time that gasoline had, I know this is going to shock you, but gasoline had increased from 32.9 to 77 cents a gallon in just a few months. And in addition to that, there was only $2 worth of available to each customer at the service stations. And we'd sit in line for up to two hours for our time to get $2 worth of gasoline. Now, you didn't let your engine run during that time. And people often pushed their cars forward 
when the next time was available. During that time, the walkathon was occurring, and a lady named Nora Lopez stalled in an intersection just adjacent to where some ladies were waiting with refreshments for those children. She was helped. She wanted to know what kind of church is this. She was, an, she was a refugee from Cuba and had slipped out with her parents being an airline stewardess, I think you could call them then. She also was taught. A year and a half or two years later, on a trip to Hawaii, she and her husband, Irmo, were also winners of a trip and were in a hotel a mile and a half from where we were. And I got an afternoon to study with the Irmo and baptized him in the Pacific Ocean next to Maui. Fishers, fishers of men are always looking for someone, someone who might just be interested. And again, please excuse me if it seems like I'm telling stories about myself, but those are the ones that I know. We built a new church building for the Hialeah Church while we were there. We moved from four blocks south of the Hialeah racetrack to out on the Tamiami, not to Tamiami, but the Palmetto Parkway, where 300,000 cars per day passed. We had exposure. Built a 1,200-seat auditorium with a school on 12 acres. And we had a big groundbreaking. I had a new next door neighbor who was a photographer. Invited him to come and record the event. And a few months later, baptized him too. They're, they're everywhere, folks. They're everywhere. The water is good, but the consciousness. And just remembering, hey, when I get up, get up this morning, I'm, I'm going fishing. If I'm going work, I'm going fishing. If I'm going on vacation, I'm going fishing. I'm going looking for somebody that I can bring to Jesus. I think the sign, gone fishing, is really appropriate for us. And I advise and encourage that for all of your life, you fish as a way of life, but not for fish, but for men. If you're here tonight and your soul isn't saved, we're fishing. We're fishing. We're trying to find a way to make the gospel appeal to you. The blood of Jesus, the salvation, the, the, the forgiveness, the hope of eternal life. What can we put out there? Well, it's all in here. And we'd love to study the Bible with you if we haven't and try to help you. If you're a part of the kingdom and you forgot what this is all about, this is it. If you drifted away, come back. If you need to rededicate yourself, join us. We're going to be fishing all this week. We're going to be fishing for little children who have an interest to learn. For their parents who may bring them. For our own kids for our own encouragement. We're fishing, finding the best ways we can to attract as many as we can into the kingdom. If tonight you're subject, then we're casting the net. Would you come while we stand and sing?